to Just Asia, AHRC TV's weekly human rights program. These are the headlines. Indonesia's executed drug kingpin alleged official involvement in drug trade. Mother and daughter gang raped in India as police failed to answer calls for help. Missing Indian girl surfaces after 10 years of being sold and raped. Thai universities ban discussions on constitution. Trials of human rights activists and lawyers continue in China. Nepal's police attended workshop on caste discrimination act. Pakistan indifferent to persons on death row. Urgent appeals from Pakistan and Indonesia. Welcome to AHRC TV's Just Asia. I am Julia Roblondo. This week, Just Asia begins with Indonesia, where the debate on the death sentence is heating up after executed Freddy Budiman's message shocked the country. Before his execution on July 29th, drug kingpin Freddy Budiman broadcasted a message that he had cooperation from the police and the National Narcotic Board for smuggling drugs to Indonesia. Freddy added that he was supported by a military general when he smuggled drugs from Medan, North Sumatera to Jakarta. In total, Freddy had transferred a total of IDR $450 billion to the National Narcotic Board and $90 billion to the police. Four convicted death row inmates were executed by firing squad on July 29th. Mr. Freddy Budiman, Mr. Michael Tatus Igwe, Mr. Humphrey Ike alias Doctor, and Mr. Sek Osman. While Freddy's message suddenly become hot news, he was brought to Nusa Kambangan prison and shot to death. There are calls for Freddy's story to be investigated and for firm sanctions to be placed on any involved officers. At the same time, the government should also review its policy in executing death row inmates, particularly as another 10 death row inmates are awaiting their final Supreme Court review. For further details, Just Asia speaks to Ricky Gunawan, lawyer for one convicted death row inmate. As we know that uh, on last Friday early morning or Thursday evening, um, Indonesia carried out its third round executions. Um, there were 14 death row prisoners who were scheduled to be executed, but on the very last minute only four people executed. Three from Nigeria and one from Indonesia. Uh, three from Nigeria are uh, Humphrey J. A. J. K. Jefferson, Michael Titus, uh, Sek Osmane, and then one from Indonesia is Freddy Budiman. There are some irregularities or uh, serious violations uh, with regard to the executions uh, last week. First, a number of death row prisoners have submitted clemency and according to the constitutional court decisions in June, uh, the deadline of one year limitation for clemency submission has been revoked, which means um, each death row prisoner still has uh, their clemency rights. The second one is about the notice of execution. Uh, prisoners receive their notifications on Tuesday afternoon, which means um, 72 hours after, after the notification, which mean will be, would be on Friday, a night would be the uh, day of the executions, but the Attorney General Office carried out the execution on Thursday uh, night or Friday early morning. So it's less than 72 hours. Uh, obviously, uh, from the beginning, Attorney General Office uh, kept the process uh, in secret. There are a lot of uh, lack of transparency with regard to the identities of the persons to be executed, uh, nationalities, and as to when the execution would be carried out. Um, including until today, there was uh, there has been no information official from the attorney office why only four uh, uh, people were executed, and then uh, what will happen with the ten? Whether the postponement is permanent or temporary, because any time they can carry out the execution soon as well. Next, India saw the gang rape of a mother and daughter in Uttar Pradesh. On July 29th, late at night, a family was on their way from Noida to Shahajanpur when their car was waylaid by a notorious gang on the national highway. Isolating the other family members, the criminals gang raped the two women and stole money and other valuables from them before disappearing. The family called the police on 100 around 1.30 a.m., but their calls remained unanswered and the police finally arrived at the crime scene only at 5 a.m after the family's relatives contacted the police station. 
The women also alleged that the doctor at the hospital they went to refused to believe they were raped. On August 1st, five men were arrested, three of whom have been identified by the survivors, while seven police officers have been suspended. Another case of rape and police inaction in India emerged on August 3rd when a 22-year-old woman surfaced 10 years after disappearing. The girl went missing in July 2006 from northeast Salhi and her family searched in vain for five years, complaining to the police and pleading with the authorities to take action. The woman has alleged that she was kidnapped and raped over 10 years, having been sold and resold to different men. According to the news reports, the 22-year-old woman said, A woman and a man abducted me. They took me to the Ambala and sold me to a man for 30,000 rupees. Later, I was sold to another man for 40,000 rupees. He and another man raped me. I tried to escape, but they caught me. After that, I was raped by many more men. She said she was sold and resold at least eight times and raped by over 30 men. The police authorities have said that they will investigate this case, claiming ignorance regarding the family's many visits to the police over the years. Next, various Thai universities are complying with the Junta's censorship measure by prohibiting their students and lecturers from discussing the Junta's sponsored draft charter and the August referendum. On Monday, Ubon Ratchani University's Dean of Political Science announced the cancellation of a public seminar titled A Free and Fair Constitutional Referendum and Its Implication for the Future of Thai Democracy, planned for August 2nd due to requests from the university executives and the provincial governor. Similarly, Chiang Mai University also announced the cancellation of its press conference titled Three Rejections in Referendum on Monday due to an order from the university's executives. Academic Somchai Prichasi Lapakul told the media that the university is gradually turning into a military camp. Earlier on Saturday, July 30th, the president of Mahirol University received a complaint letter from the Thai Election Commission regarding Kotom Ariya, the director of Mahirol University's research center for peace building who usually criticizes the junta and the draft charter. The latter wanted the university to urge Kotom to stop the criticism. At the same time, Jerawat Sanichon, deputy dean of Konkan University's Faculty of Agriculture, barred student activists of the Dao Din group from hosting Talk for Freedom, a public discussion on the draft charter to be held on Sunday. However, the students insisted on going ahead with the event. To learn more, Just Asia interviews Jatupat Bon Pataraska, an activist from the Dao Din group. มันถูกทําให้แคบมากกลายเป็นเสรีภาพที่ต้องเห็นด้วยกับคอสชเป็นตามแนวทางของเขาแต่ขณะเดียวกันเสรีภาพของนักศึกษาหรือเสรีภา
accused of working with rights lawyers from the Fengview law firm to attack the national legal system and provoke people's hatred against the government. Tsai was given a relatively light sentence, suggesting he might have cooperated with the investigation. With his sentence suspended for four years, he will live under restrictions and surveillance during that time and could be sent to prison if he talks to journalists or resume public activism. Many of the detained lawyers and activists were associated with the Fengri law firm, previously headed by Cao Shi Feng, who is also expected to go on trial this week. Before the firm was shut down in July 2015, it was known for defending the disfranchise and those trying to build civil society in China. A prominent lawyer at the firm, Wang Yu, who represented feminist activists and members of Ban's spiritual movement Falun Gong, appeared in a videotaped interview on Monday, denouncing Tao Feng and blaming foreign forces for the law firm's activities. According to the human rights groups, Wang's interview was clearly coerced and part of an attempt by the Chinese authorities to lend legal legitimacy to its crackdown. Although Wang Yu has been reportedly been released on bail after participating in the videotaped interview, her husband remains in detention, facing possible trial on subversion charges, and authorities are watching her grandparents and teenage son. According to the China Human Rights Lawyers Concern Group, that means Wang's freedom and her family's safety could be threatened if she were to speak out. In Nepal, the Asian Human Rights Commission, in partnership with the Red of Nepal, organized a regional workshop with police officers on the caste-based discrimination and untouchability, Act 2011. The two days workshop on July 29th to 30th was well attended by police officers from 11 districts of the eastern region as well as civil society members, Dalit advocates and media personnel. The overall objective of the workshop was to protect and promote the rights of those suffering from caste-based discrimination and untouchability. There was a special focus on empowering police officers on the Caste-Based Discrimination Act, its importance and difficulties in execution. While experts discuss domestic and international law aspects, Police Inspector Ganga Paldul of the Eastern Regional Police Office presented the nature of discrimination cases registered in his region. Participants also discussed whether untouchability should be considered a civil or criminal offense and whether implementation of laws will act as deterrent. <laughs>
Moving to Pakistan, the country has gone from a non-executing state to an executing state in the last 19 months. At present, every month, 22 persons are hanged, starting from December 2014 when the moratorium on hanging was lifted 413 persons have so far been executed. The military forced Pakistan's civilian government to lift the moratorium after 150 children and staff were massacred in Peshawar on 16 December 2014 by terrorists. Although only hardened criminals and terrorists were to be executed, among the 413 individuals executed so far, hardly 15 to 20 were terrorists. The rest were all victims of poor investigation, custodial torture and forced confessions, unfair trials and poor performance of the lower judiciary. The government, however, does not want to review its policy on execution under pressure from the security establishment. Indifferent to the plight of many prisoners who should not even be on death row, such as those arrested as children or suffering from severe physical or mental illnesses. The government is all set to complete the execution of about 8,000 persons. Finally, the Urgent Appeals Weekly features two cases from Pakistan and Indonesia. In Pakistan, Baloch publisher and employee of civil hospital Karachi was taken away on July 26 by plainclothes persons impersonating a state intelligence officers and since then, his whereabouts are unknown. Wahid Baloch was taken away from a bus as he was returning home from a wedding simply because his name as written on his identity card was Baloch. Police have refused to file a first information report. In Indonesia, police officers acted in support of a development company that assaulted, arrested, and shot inhabitants of Linga village. Police used live bullets and caused the death of one villager. As a law enforcement agency, the police ignored reports filed by villagers about the company violations and to date have failed to conduct a proper investigation into this incident. That is all for this episode of Just Asia. For more on these and other issues, please visit www.humanrights.asia or www.alrc.asia forward slash Just Asia. Thank you for watching and see you next week.